and let me share my screen. And so I'm, um, I'm going to turn off my camera, you guys, just because of the, the challenges with, um, actually, let me do that like this. Hold up. Let me uh, turn off my camera just so I can maybe not lag as much. Am I sounding okay before, before we go forward, you guys? Am I sounding all right to you guys? Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. And if, and so do me a favor, since I'm, I'm in the van here and, and mobile broadcasting to you guys, um, if something is wrong, do me a favor and unmute and just interrupt me. Well, you can interrupt me anytime, but, but particularly if something is weird, I won't be able to see if you guys necessarily raise your hand or something. Cool. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. And everybody can see my desktop. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, looks good. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so uh, we're going to uh, shift a little bit today. We're still talking about fragmentation, the destruction of ecosystems and or the breaking of those ecosystems into smaller pieces. Um, but we're going to talk about a different flavor uh, today, which is uh, the structures that are already linear and what happens when um, or, or the, some, some special cases of, of fragmentation that happens there. So, for example, this is one of our classic um, you know, Western dams where we've gone in into a relatively arid area um, where water is going through and we've decided we wanted to ca- we want to capture that water. And so this has gone on in the Western US, but it's gone on all across the US. It's gone all across the planet and it is continuing to happen. And indeed, many of the um, most craziest places right now in the world that are that are having political str- struggles, social strife, all that kind of stuff, many of them are deeply, deeply exacerbated, if not initiated, by the damming of rivers and the attempt to control water, either for, for human use or for power or for irrigation. Um, and this is... Um, uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you guys get it. So, one of our classic Western dams here. Um, and... Uh, we most typically come to this in the context of conservation biology um, when we talk about uh, or when we think about um, organisms that use that water, that, that typically move up and down that uh, linear structure of a river or a stream. And so the classic example would be a, a salmon, a, a salmonid. As a review, when we talk about fragmentation, we, there's a mix here, right? We've talked about this. There are natural processes that can fragment an ecosystem, and there are human-driven uh, uh, causes of fragmentation. Um, both happen, both are real, but as we mentioned in our, our previous discussions, the, natural process, the, the fragmentation that results from natural processes tends to be um, qualitatively different from the fragmentation that tends to happen from most human-driven processes. And most human-driven processes, if you remember things like um, a very clear delineation um, from the, the um, uh, previous ecosystem to the new thing, to the concrete, to the farm crops or whatever. And that, that's illustrated by this top picture with this very, um, you know, almost like black and white uh, edge, very, very hard edge. Um, for example, ultimately, what all this means, whether it's a natural or a or a, um, a human-driven fragmentation or breaking up of a contiguous uh, a patch, um, that that that's, species are spatially associated or are spatially arranged. We can con- conceive of uh, populations spatially, and that as we fragment them, we're essentially carving them into smaller and smaller populations. In the context of metapopulations, we use the term patch for the quote-unquote habitat and matrix for the stuff that was was inhospitable or not ideal habitat. Okay, so um, we really have uh, four different potential flavors that can happen when we have uh, fragmentation. Um, We could theoretically have habitat loss and no fragmentation. So this would be an erosion of the area. So this would be if we, um, let's say uh, a fire went around an area, right? So it burned up from the edges and it may be, you know, um, consumed some of the forest, but it didn't, it didn't go into the forest. So that would be um, habitat for, uh, sorry, 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 I hope this makes sense. So we have uh, the hashed uh, tag, uh, the hashed um, 
uh, patch here would represent the core or the patch or the, or the habitat for the organism in question. And then the, the white area would represent the matrix or the inhospitable area for the organism. Okay, so we can have the top one shows we can have habitat loss, but no fragmentation. We can have uh, habitat loss and fragmentation, which is pretty common. We could have fragmentation, but no habitat loss if we somehow paired this with, let's say, some succession that was allowed to have rapid succession or some active ecological restoration where we, we planted trees outside of the historic area, let's say, so the forest was able to expand. So theoretically, you can get that. Not, not very common, but, but it's, it's possible. Indeed, that second, uh, excuse me, that, that third example is really what we, is the goal of much of our restoration policy, which is, yes, we understand there's going to be a freeway going through here and might, might not be ideal, but okay, we're going to put a freeway through here. Um, having said that, um, maybe we can go ahead and add more wetland um, on the other side of the freeway or, or whatever it is so that it, there is fragmentation, but we don't lose total acreage of that um, uh, a community, let's say. Um, so while that, that's often the goal, we don't usually achieve that. Um, and then uh, the fourth example, which is probably the most common, and this is the, the example from Louisiana where I was walking around and, and making videos for you guys um, uh, the last few days, southern Louisiana, coastal Louisiana, uh, and that is uh, the, the impact would be one habitat loss, so re absolute reduction in acreage and extent. Two, fragmentation, and so the splitting of the once contiguous chunk into smaller chunks. But then also degradation. And so the chunks that do remain are, do not function the same way, do not provide the same ecosystem services as the pre-disturbed uh, ecosystem. So in other words, number, number two and number four are the most common um, uh, consequences. And I would say number four is more often than not the, the most typical way we are engaging with ecosystems when we have impacts related to fragmentation and loss. Does that make sense? So I don't hear anything. I'm, I'm assuming it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, okay. it makes sense. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, again, as a bit of review here, uh, fragmentation can have um, all kinds of changed uh, 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 consequences for organisms that remain. One is reduced access to patches and reduced access to resources in those patches. Um, we can, um, uh, organisms that uh, maybe were able to persist no problemo before now um, are much uh, more sort of on the edge. Uh, 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 sorry, I shouldn't say that because that, that'll confuse you with edge effects. Um, much more, uh, much closer to danger is a better way to say that. So the classic example would be um, vulnerable to extinction, but we could see vulnerability to all manner of stresses. Um, we've, we see um, stress loans in things like birds and vertebrates um, when they're in a fragmented uh, uh, community are tend to be much higher. You can imagine if you're in a big, thick old forest, you're all good. And maybe there's a predator sometimes, but usually there's not. And you're kind of chilling versus if all of a sudden you're on a, a patch where you're much more exposed to the sun, much more exposed to, say, flying predators or something. You're, mu you're, mu you're much more jittery and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, so all of that leads to increased stress. And overall, as the community becomes smaller and smaller, we see increased um, uh, excuse me, expansion of the edges, expansion of the edge effects. So what used to be a relatively thin um, uh, a transition, uh, and then you're in the core habitat, becomes much, much larger. So most of your potential habitat is, is in some form of edge oftentimes. And the edge is generally speaking less favorable. Um, the, the types of resources that are available are generally of lower quality. Think of refuge from predators. Think of berries to eat or other food resources. Um, and also they're a mechanism for um, predators, in particular disease and, in, and invasive species, to get at you. And that's one of the main things we're battling in southern Louisiana. Um, we've been working on that for 20 years to try to deal with some of the um, invasions. Okay, so that, that's general stuff. Um, uh, 
we've been thinking about so far, you've been doing your, your um, explorations of um, fragmentation in the context of roads. So here's an example of one of our Southern California coastal lagoons down in San Diego. And, um, and so we've been, mostly been thinking of the, the human lines here. So the human lines would be the, the roadways, for example, right? So roadkill, things of that nature. And so here, clearly the I-5 right here, if we're talking about, say, this, this upland habitat, this grassland, chaparral, et cetera, habitat, the road is sliced this once contiguous blob the I-5 corridor is now slice it up into this blob over here and this blob over here. So that's a classic example of fragmentation. And that's, I think, you know, what most people would describe as, you know, if you said, name an example of fragmentation for me, most people would say something like roads. And you guys hopefully now would say something like roads. Um, there is another variation, which is kind of interesting, which is the, um, the and so big, big two-dimensional area um, that we are snipping right, that we are slicing up. The other would be a essentially a line that we are slicing through. And so this would be um, a dam, a dam, um, some type of barrier in the, in the stream so that uh, critters that normally can only go to the right or left, for example, in this tidal creek right here, I'm showing you, right? So this, this channel here. So we have fresh water dumping in, we have seawater here coming in. And so we're having this estuary, this mixing of between salt water over here and fresh water over here. And so we have this, this brackish area. And so sometimes, sometimes critters, let's say if they like fresh water and it's really, really rainy, like it's been the last few weeks, now that fresh water lens is pushed down over here. So now I, maybe I can, I can shift my distribution down here near the racetrack. Um, okay, cool. But now maybe it stops raining. And so now it stops raining and the high tide, it's high tide. And so now the salt water lens is pushing back up. Now, if I'm a freshwater critter, I'm going to retreat back up farther up this channel, right? That's the normal um, uh, waxing and waning and going on of, of uh, life in one of these coastal streams, for example. But barriers to this um, are really, really dramatic. <clears throat> excuse me, really, really dramatic. Whereas in the, the, the roadkill uh, sort of idea, <clears throat> you know, critters can go about their lives and then when they try to get to the other side, they get whacked. Um, in this case, roads and, and, and stream barriers are much, are oftentimes much more dramatic because that's going to mean these critters cannot go. So, so if they're down here and then the salt water starts to push in, there literally is nowhere to go, right? Or, well, for, for fish, at least, there is nowhere for them to go and vice versa. So these um, linear uh, uh, messing with rivers um, and freshwater is quite problematic. Here is, here is um, this is, this is a, probably about a decade or so old now, so I haven't updated this, uh, this graphic, but I think very few of these have changed. So this is a map on the right of barriers to fish movement. So let's talk about um, uh, fragmentation in the context of stream and rivers in the context of vertebrate fish movement. So a fish could be on one side of the river and swim downstream perhaps for, for a while, <clears throat> and either in a different time of the day or different time of the year or different part of the life cycle of the fish, it can also uh, swim upstream if it, if it so choose, chose, if it was in the natural state. We humans like to not let that happen. So we humans like to add barriers. Now, some of these barriers are uh, by design, by design barriers. So for example, right here in the lower left, this is a little impoundment um, for that a farmer has put, or a rancher, excuse me, has put on to accumulate water so that <clears throat> some of uh, his cattle can have more easy access to drinking, right? So here in the, in the regular channel, maybe the water is, is pretty shallow. And so maybe it's a little hard for the cows to, you know, stick their tongue in and lick the water up. Um, uh, and so he's like, okay, hey, I'm going to create an impoundment. So I'm going to create a, a usually concrete, but it could be out of rocks or, or other things, Cre create a dam. And this is going to impound the water. The water is going to build up behind it. And, um, uh, and, then, and then my cows can drink, right? So that's one example of, of a barrier. Um, another would be something like uh, this. So this is a culvert. So this is a culvert underneath a road. So if I, if I, the picture is a little bit larger, you would see where it says barriers to fish on the, this part of my slide, you would see a roadway. 
So in this case, this is a struct. So this was an area where water, say it's in a, a creek or a, a draw a drainage, that water water either always flows or sometimes flows. And we wanted to put a road there. And for structural reasons, it was it was easiest for us to just fill in the entire river and just dump a bunch of dirt or boulders or other other structure, concrete, something in the way. And that would support the roadbed. So maybe allow us to, to drive heavier trucks over the um, over, over the bridge or over the pass, whatever the heck it is. But then, of course, there's all this water that's going to start pooling up. So then we'll put um, this, which is a, a water movement structure, a culvert, so that water can go from one side of the road to the other. Um, the problem is uh, now um, that's pretty hard for the fish to, to move through, right? So one, it might be difficult for the fish to move. And two, the way this one was built originally, if you guys can see this, originally the 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 culvert is here, water is flowing from the other side of the river out towards us, out towards us um, uh, 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 as we're sitting here in the pic look at the picture. And so originally the water poured straight down, right? So it dropped about 10 feet down to uh, uh, this pool and then it went downstream, right? So the water could move perhaps okay. The water could maybe not erode the um, footing of the of the road, but for fish, now all of a sudden they have to jump up a 10 foot, a 10 foot um, uh, ramp, right? A 10 foot uh, a waterfall. Theoretically possible for some fish, but pretty darn hard. And then we have other kinds of, of structures which were not, not originally perhaps a barrier to fish movement, but have become one. And so this is a so-called Arizona crossing. Has anybody heard of an Arizona? Does anybody know what I say mean when I say Arizona crossing? Have you guys heard that before? No. No. Hmm. Okay. So an Arizona crossing. So typically, it's so like this thing up here. This thing is, is a is, you know is, a, is an overpass. Is a bridge. You and I could walk across it. You and I could bike across it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You and I could drive a vehicle across it. Um. And, but that, that, that takes a lot of engineering, right? It takes a lot of people. Um, it takes engineers, uh, 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 you know, lots of money and all this and that. Arizona crossings are more what we see across the, and it's so named because they were commonly used in, in Arizona in the Southwest. But the idea is you're a rancher, you have a big chunk of land typically, and you have this draw. And so this is this little, uh, usually seasonal river or, or, or not very um, fast flowing river. So low volume. And so uh, maybe just driving across, maybe if you drove across it in your truck, it's not a problem. Once or twice or 10 times. But if you're driving across it a lot, you're going to start to dish out, right? The, the, the tires are going to start to hit the mud. It's going to start to get all, and maybe you would get stuck as you're, with your vehicle, or maybe you'd start to screw up the river more or something, right? And or um, maybe during the summertime, you can totally drive through the, the cross the, the dry river, um, but not but not in the winter time, right? So in the winter time, there's water in there, it gets harder. So what what's a common thing to do and a very easy thing to do? It's your property, right? So you can do what you want. Is get a few bags of cement or a lot of bags of cement, and essentially pour a concrete pad across the the bottom, right? So a thin concrete pad. So as wide as your truck, or or maybe a little bit wider than your truck, right? And 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 just and just uh, just just like I described, usually has a little bit of lip on the right and left, so water can easily flow over it, etc. And um, and you might look at that, we might say, oh, that's not a barrier to fish move, and that's because it's it's very little. It's it's only maybe you know a couple inches thick, right? So it's not it's not a ten foot drop like this. It's not a big giant lip like this thing over here on the left. But what tends to happen with Arizona crossings is they're usually done by people that, you know, well, well intentioned, they're not trying to screw up the river or anything, but they just pour it. But over time, something happens. Maybe it's a big series of, uh, a, 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 you know, occasional big dump like we're having right now or, or a series of dumps. So water flows really hard and it goes over and it does a little like whoosh, splashing, whoosh, eroding, cutting. And so it starts to cut a little head at the, at the side. And then it goes a little more and a little more. And eventually it's going to create something that's much more analogous to this thing, right? So it's going to create a big, deep pool. And again, it can be hard for some critters to, especially smaller fish, to get over that. So, um, you know, if we had an Arizona crossing, if we had a small impoundment from a farmer, if we had a, uh, 
a, um, uh, you know, culvert under a, a bridge or two, you know, no big deal. But we have tens of thousands of these in the state of California alone. So this is um, a, a map of that. And this is just for the coastal counties, just for coastal California, coastal watersheds. This doesn't include all the Sierra, doesn't include all the desert, doesn't include all that other stuff. So this is just our immediate stuff. And the, and the excuse me, the um, white are things that either, um, that may not be now, but, but actually may well become a fish passage barrier in the very near future. The gray is something that's kind of a problem. So the gray would be something like this Arizona crossing. So that for some fish, it's a problem. For others, um, maybe not. And then the red is a complete uh, fish passage barrier. There is no way any, even the super a superhero of a super fish could possibly get through the barrier. And so have a look at that. What you see is you see a bunch of white and a crap load of red, right? And so remember, red is a complete passage. Red means we cannot go past there. So that's a huge problem. So, um, so dealing, with, uh, dealing with this is, is non-trivial. What we've tried to do is, for example, right here, is, is put in what we, what we call a fish ladder. Um, so a fish ladder is, a, is, is an additional structure, down, on, usually on the downstream side of an obstruction of a barrier to help fish move upstream across the barrier. So in this case, can you see that? In this case, there's two types of fish ladders. One, there's this one here on the right, uh, called, also called a run, and there's this guy over here on the left. The idea with the guys here on the left is it can facilitate fish moving downstream more easily. So if a fish is trying to go from, from uh, inside your computer screen out into your, in, out into your face, right? They can come through and boom, splash here, and then kind of boom, splash here, and then boom, splash here, and go downstream relatively easily. This guy is an upstream ladder, and and so theoretically, fish can go both ways. But this is this is easier for fish to go up, and so this has a deep pool right here. And the idea is uh, uh, a fish goes like, just like you guys maybe remember like when you're in the pool and you're a kid and you're trying to jump up and, and grab someone, you kind of go down and then burst out, right? So that's how fish jump, that's how fish naturally move upstream from, from pools to pools to pools. So they kind of go down, basically go down and then kick up. And so they, boom, they, they launch themselves over into the next pool. And they take a rest for a minute or two and they kind of go down, boom, and then go up to the next pool. So we can, so, so even when we have some structures like that, um, red indicates none of that would work. And it turns out that most of our fish ladders, this is also called a fish ladder, most of our fish ladders actually suck. So most of our fish ladders actually do not um, successfully move a large percentage of fish um, through uh, from below the obstruction to above the obstruction. So we have a lot of challenges with with barriers here. Um, the the classic critter that we're talking about in this context is an, a so-called anadromous fish. So that would be a salmon or something uh, in the salmon salmon family, which we usually refer to as a salmonid for this group of organisms. Um, the classic one of these individuals would be something like a Chinook salmon or, or, or a King salmon or pink salmon, one of these individuals, which start out in the, uh, f uh, uh, from um, an egg laid in a freshwater stream, fertilized, uh, develops, hatches, and then moves downstream. And the, the, the classic salmon that we love to eat um, will go downstream uh, uh, and then will actually, if, and physiologically changes, right? So if we take a freshwater fish and you, you and I pick it up and you and I walk to the ocean, you know, maybe a just born uh, a fi a salmon fingerling, and we go and walk it into the ocean, throw it in the ocean, it'll die, right? It'll, it'll osmotically pop. It, it'll, it'll, it'll essentially, its gills um, will osmotically not be able to handle the, the, the changing salt um, concentrations and they, it will lice, it'll pop open and they will essentially suffocate and die over the course of a, a couple minutes. Same thing, if I take an oceanic steelhead, uh, excuse me, an oceanic um, uh, salmon and pick it up, 
put it in a cooler of salt water, drive it inland to a freshwater stream, dump it in the freshwater stream, um, it'll also die. Uh, within a, it'll hit the water, its gills will, will pop, and it'll essentially uh, suffocate and die for the course of a couple of minutes. So a really amazing physiological thing happens. Naturally, when the, when the freshwater critter goes down to the ocean, um, it stops at certain points and its body changes and it changes the amount of uh, solutes and things in its blood, et cetera, and it makes itself able to handle the salt water. And then it'll spend some time sort of in the upper part of an estuary, kind of getting used to it, and then go a little bit deeper, a little, and finally it'll be able to swim into the full ocean. Same thing when that critter is ready to come back to spawn up in the freshwater stream, it does the exact reverse. It comes in, hangs out in the estuary for a while, changes its, changes its blood chemistry, and then, and then, you know, slowly kind of goes farther into the fresher and fresher, and then eventually can swim in the fresh water. Um, so, uh, so a steelhead and a rainbow trout is the same thing. We'll talk about more of that next time. But I just, but, but, but our local version in Southern California is the steelhead or rainbow trout. This is the same species without giving, without spending too much time on the next lecture. Um, it's the same thing. A steelhead is the for, same species, the form that goes from a freshwater area to a marine area, a saltwater area. A rainbow trout does the same thing, but never gets to the ocean. So it might go from a, a stream down into Lake Tahoe and Lake Tahoe back into that stream, or one stretch of a stream into a down uh, area part of that stream and then back up. So, so same species, just the rainbow means that it doesn't get to the ocean. Um, and the steelhead actually does get to the ocean. So this would be the classic example of a, a critter potentially impacted by fragmentation of freshwater systems. Yeah, I just said that. So I'll say that for later. I'll say that for later. Okay. So um, wait, wait a second. I think I'm in my wrong lecture. Hold on again. Wait. Okay. There. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So that. So we'll just skip that. I want to. I want to go into more detail later, but that's not for today. Okay. So um. So examples of the kinds of things we do to our rivers and fragment them. Actually, the so the most vulnerable ecosystems on the planet are freshwater systems. So if I ask you a quiz question, for example, hint hint on on which ecosystems on the planet are most threatened are most endangered it's going to be freshwater systems freshwater systems have been fragmented more than any other ecosystem on the planet i know that coral reefs i know that uh, tropical rainforests get all the attention um, but it's really freshwater systems that are the most changed we dump pollution into there we fragment them we dump in invaders in them and so so freshwater systems are the most tweaked of our ecosystems on the face of the earth. We can do this. So, so far we've talked about damming and, and, and barriers, obstructions to, to how water flows. We also um, can fragment these systems by channelizing them. And so an example of this would be the LA River, the Los Angeles River. And so we, this is a guy, uh, this is a salmon from the LA River, right? So downtown, Los Angeles, you used to be able to get salmon 100 years ago. Right? And this little kid's fishing in um, essentially near downtown LA. Um, in the 19, uh, so so if you guys have not watched the film Chinatown, you guys should watch the film Chinatown. It's a it's a it's a cool noir mystery movie kind of thing, just in and of itself. But but at its core is this environmental story um, of uh, of how LA developed. It's a fictionalized story, so it's not it's not exactly how it happened, but it's it's quite um, quite strongly borrows from what actually happened, right? Um, and and it's all around uh, dealing with water and dealing with water movement and control of water. And so what we see in the early 1900s into the sort of World War II era, era, we have a lot of flooding. We actually have a lot of flooding at this time in Florida, a lot of flooding at this time in the Mississippi River, a drainage, and, and this put, and then of course in California, places like um, Los Angeles. And so this pushes a lot of people to say, oh my God, nature is evil. We need to stop this horrible, evil, na evil nature. And so this, this picture of this house is falling um, here is, I think from the 1930s into the LA River. So, oh my God, how can we stand this? So here is some. Um, this is gonna work. This is gonna work. Maybe my, maybe my bandwidth is too slow. 
Okay. Sorry, you guys. Stop playing. Anyway, I, I just have uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll I'll put this in a little clip. This is basically just some some uh, snippets of flooding in LA in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Um, suffice it to say, there's flooding, right? So we have the, uh, some video here of some old cars getting flooded and the various things. So so this is horrible. So we decide the answer for us is to channelize the river. So so we start in the in the 30s and 40s, we start channelizing the LA River. And so now we have what we, we've we've constrained the river. So one week, if we put a if we put a structure across this way across a river, we call that a dam. If we put a, a hardened structure across the length of the, the banks of the river, we call that a levee, or or if we do that and extend that into the bottom, we call that a channel. The channelization, which is what we did to the LA River, does not allow the natural meandering of the river to occur. So we constrain it, we constrict it, we make it stay in its fixed position. As a reminder, the entire Oxnard Plain was part was the river mouth for the Santa Clara River. So the Santa Clara River over its course has moved all the way from the city of Ventura all the way over to campus. And back and it's meandered back and forth, meandered back and forth, meandered back and forth. We've now mostly tried to channel it. So you can channelize things by pouring concrete, an extreme version, like in LA here, both concrete on the sides and concrete on the bottom and 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 trap it there. Or we can do the kind of thing we're doing with the um, Santa Clara River, which is just dump stuff on the side. Um, so some cases concrete, in other cases just hard boulders, and try to fix that channel and not let it jump around. So that's going to also uh, impact critters that want to use the river, right? So 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 the the connection of the river with the terrestrial environment. So both levying or channelizing the cre the the river or the stream, as well as damming, both have fragmentation effects on the river. In the case of the LA River, that was the sit that was deemed a good thing, right? That was deemed a, a, a societal good. And so um, so the idea there was uh, hey, let's get the water this was this was the mantra, get the water off the landscape as fast as possible. Because water is bad, water is evil, water floods us and causes problems. So therefore we want to take the water, shove it into a little channel shove that little channel into a big channel, shove, the, shove that bigger channel into a bigger channel, which would be the, which would be, sorry about that, which would be the main stem um, uh, 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 LA River, and then take that and shove that to the Pacific Ocean as fast as possible, right? What you're hearing now in, in our, our recent era of atmospheric rivers and drought, people are saying, why are we throwing all that water into the ocean? What a stupid idea, right? We're doing that because that's what we designed it. That's what we designed our, our 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 hydrological management system to do. Now the current uh, approach or the current thinking is that was that was dumb. We shouldn't have done that. That was bad. What we should do now is turn the river on the left into something like the river on the right. Here in my images. So one, we should allow the river back to do its meandering, right? So it should be able to move back and forth. We should allow it to jump out of its main channel into some at least limited floodplain to allow all the ecological functioning there and the species support, habitat, et cetera. But also that leads to reduce flooding downstream. Um, take barriers like dams out of the stream. And um, uh, also, in addition to all the, the benefits there, it leads to potentially fantastic uh, human benefits as well. So um, earlier in my trip, I drove through San Antonio, and unfortunately, it was nighttime, so I couldn't make any. I was going to make a video for you guys, but but um, so 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 a lot of uh, cities and towns have rediscovered their rivers, and they've made so-called river walks, and they've they've actually um, said, hey, the river is now a great part of this town, and we should feature that. So rather than doing the, what LA did, which is sort of channelize the river and make it ugly and put everything away for it. And the only thing it's good for are Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and, and you know, 1970s uh, cops and robbers, uh, you know, chase scenes. Um, uh, rather, this could be a place where people can recreate. This could be a people, place where people can exercise. This could be a place where people can, can relax, they can have dinner, where they can have some drinks, 
all that kind of stuff. And so that is the current plan for the LA River. We're talking about 50 years to do this, but we've begun to restore parts of the LA River um, and, and rip up this channelization, you know, ch change some of this fragmentation and severing of the river and introduce more natural components that would allow both groundwater recharge, recreation, and have a better aesthetic and, a, and, a, and you know, more park-like setting for uh, critters as well as people. Dams overall are a huge problem. And so one of the things you're gonna look at in our, uh, in our materials this week is, is a, a, a great documentary called Dam Nation um, and, uh, and, and some other videos. But suffice it to say, key factoid, key, key thing you should know for, for quizzes perhaps, um, is that we have something on the order of about 1,000 large dams across the U.S. I'll say that again. We have 48,000 large dams over the U.S., defined as 50 feet or greater. I know it's in feet. It should be in meters, but it's these way these engineers, these, these American engineers do stuff. So, so their criterion they used in this one measuring was feet. So I'll use feet, even though I ask you guys to always use metric. Um, but, but um, you know, 50 feet is a honking, honking dam. That's a, that's a, that's a big thing. That's a major construction thing. Um, and, and 50, almost 50,000 of these things, it is insane. Two thirds of the world's major rivers are dammed with major dams. Almost all of them are dammed if we talk about minor, if we talk about smaller dams, like, you know, little small catchments and things. They're providing something on the order of magnitude of about one fifth of the world's electricity, so hydroelectric. Um, they're actually really useful uh, because um, they're one of our few natural batteries. So whereas with oil and gas, if we if we're if we're burning the electricity and all of a sudden we suddenly find oh we don't we don't need that um, uh, anymore we just stop burning the oil and gas. But with sun or wind or or other renewable resources, they're kind of flowing when they're flowing. We don't always have them. Dams are actually a, a key way we can time shift um, our electrical demand. And so what we can do is in addition to allowing water to flow from this side of the dam down through these big turbines down to the bottom and turn those turbines and generate electricity, we could also reverse that. We could also have a straw down here in the downstream section. And actually, when we have, uh, say, solar energy or wind energy, whatever, to burn, we can turn the reverse pumps and suck that water up and put it behind the dam to use it as a gravity storage. And so then at night, maybe when the solar uh, panels aren't working, then we can allow that that um, water to go back down through the regular dam uh, turbines and turn them. So, so it's an important part of our mix or of our current um, uh, power mix uh, uh, in, uh, as we try to convert to less fossil fuel intensive um, uh, uh, sources. But, uh, and so the, the benefit, but there's also, and also we can get the irrigation from them, but the downsides are that dams tend to be pretty lame. So with the exception of that power generation, dams seem to pretty much mostly be bad for every single thing else. Fish movement, obviously, but also um, they tend to be way more expensive than people claim. They tend to be way more expensive than people claim. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the Matillaha uh, next time. But um, suffice it to say, they, they tend to at least double whatever people say they're going to cost. Um, the construction uh, tends to take years longer than people estimate. And turns out we actually waste a tremendous amount of water by, by holding, in, in the American Southwest at least, in the arid Southwest, we tend to waste a tremendous amount of this water because it is sitting there in the hot sun evaporating. So if we wanted to store that water, and if we even, and that, that's a debatable thing, but if, if we're saying we wanna use that wa water in a freshwater system, it's actually better to take that water and put it underground or into an aquifer where it essentially doesn't evaporate, wouldn't disappear to the atmosphere. Um, uh, the other thing to say about dams real quickly as, as we wrap up here, because I've, I've talked longer than I thought I would, is, um, is dams always sediment in. So not only does, does this dam entrain water, 
it's also going to trap sediment. Sediment is all another thing that's moved downstream by the water, but is a thing that is typically captured behind that dam. So all dams have a limited lifespan. So all dams have a certain number of years where they will effectively work. And, uh, and, 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 and nobody really has great play. So, so if it's a small dam, if it's a little 10 foot high dam, we can deal with that. We can go maybe go in and, and, and dig out some of the sediment every few years or decade or two or something. For the massive, massive dams that we started creating about 75 to 100 years ago, no one has ever proposed any way to clear out that sediment. Um, and it's a huge problem. It's a huge part of the, the, the challenge. So we know what to do. The, the answer is from a conservation perspective is take some of these dams down um, uh, because they have huge problems associated with them. The things I mentioned, as well as direct displacement of people. So two sabbaticals ago, I spent my sabbatical with my colleagues in Turkey working on um, trying to stop a dam that was proposed to go in near the um, border with Turkey and um, um, uh, Armenia and Iran. And essentially the Turks want to capture the water so that the Armenians don't get the water and the Iranians don't get the water. And it's a pure political play. Um, all kinds of social dis disruption. These large dams displace, uh, have displaced somewhere in the order of 40 to 80 million people across the planet in the last few decades, as well as destroyed a massive amount of, of um, prehistoric and historic um, uh, uh, culture, uh, flooding um, important uh, burial sites, flooding important um, uh, traditional cultural sites, religious sites, all kinds of badness there. And, uh, and just, it just outright destroying uh, sustainable um, systems that have built up along these rivers over generations or thousands of years. So these dams, these especially large dams are really, really detrimental. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll just say that. So on the picture on the left is an example of one uh, such, in this case, a church being um, uh, flooded. The one on the, on the center here is th the Three Gorges Dam in China, which, um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just insane. It's, it's beyond uh, insane how the scale here um, and, and insane numbers of villagers and villages were just outrightly destroyed um, with the creation and then the filling of the water behind that dam. Uh, and so, um, so I mentioned before, we have about 50,000 um, uh, large dams, bigger than 50 feet. Um, and here's, I just wanted to visualize this for you. If we, if we talk about all these dams of different sizes, we have on the order of about 85,000 dams, right? And so, so I wanted to show this to you to, to sort of wrap up this initial introduction to talking about fragmentation of freshwater systems to show you what that looks like. So what we see here is the large dams, right? The largest dams are these are, well, large dams are 50 and 100. And so what I'm showing you here, each dot represents a particular dam in the US. And so I think you, I think you guys can all see, and I would do this as a and a but I, it might be a little hard on Zoom here. But, um, but what, what well, I'll just ask you, let's see if we're, what pattern do you guys notice here? What pattern do you notice with, with dams in the US? Uh, there's a lot of, sorry, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of big ones uh, on the West Coast. There's not many small ones and a lot of big okay. ones. Okay, Especially good. Especially Central Valley, it looks like. Yep, yep. And somebody else was going to say something? Caleb said it for me. He said it right. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, right. So so it's not a dam. It, dams are diverse, right? So we in the Western U.S., when we think of dams, we tend to think of the yellow and the and the and the red, right? We have a lot of these big things, Hoover Dam, and all these big giant, um, you know, Shasta Dam, all these big giant ones, um, Hetch Hetchy, et cetera, uh, and those are really real. This is primarily a Western phenomenon, although there's some over here um, with the Tennessee Valley Authority and, and, and some of those uh, places. But for the most part, most of the U.S. has smaller dams, right? So they're, they're more, um, the more human size. They're still 25 to 50 feet. They can, that's a, it can be a honking dam, right? That can be 
pretty big. Um, but it's nevertheless, it's not this order of magnitude that we have uh, out here uh, for the most part in the, in the Western US. So um, dams are regulated by different entities across the US, depends on where we're talking, and it depends on the size. The US Army Corps of Engineers is the, is the big, essentially, dam builder. Um, and also, they are then the dam, uh, ironically, they're also the dam breaker. So they are the entity that has to approve the removal of dams. Our current approach to things is to remove dams. Our current approach, by and large, is to get rid of these these obstructions. And the neat thing is, whereas with the roads and the other fragmentation examples we've been talking about, it can be hard to restore those rivers, right? Or to, excuse me, it's I just said that wrong. It can be hard to restore those ecosystems. Grassland, we've destroyed it with a parking lot. We have to go in and replant, find the seeds and do all this kind of stuff, right? Find the trees, whatever. With dams, essentially, in, in, some, in a lot of cases, especially the smaller dams, all we need to do is rip it out. And in fact, you'll see in damnation is some examples where you can rip it out with dynamite, right? So, so it, it's, it's a really cool conservation story because with a little bit of effort and a little bit of money, we can potentially restore the entirety of that hydrological function. And it's much harder when we have the other types of fragmentation. So, so fresh water, uh, uh, moving waterways, rivers and streams um, are actually easier to restore and conceptually easier to restore, financially easier to restore, temporally easier to restore. Um, it just it just takes the will. Um, and so next time we'll talk about Matillaha and some of the stories and the challenges we have in our coastal streams here in California. But I just wanted to make sure you guys had that, that sense of uh, the scale of what was going on with streams. Um, uh, yeah, so I already mentioned all this. Okay, so that's what I want to mention today, you guys. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't want to take up the whole time, and I wasn't sure how well my internet was. But um, with that, I am going to pause and and say uh, thanks, you guys, and, and do a quick check-in. I'm just going to kill our recording here. Um, and I just want to...